So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second session of the best practices session. Today, uh, June 10, uh, we have a very nice group of people uh, talking and we will be talking the classical aspects of every session with the climatic information, some practices and a discussion. But to introduce our first speaker, I would like to give the word to, to the president of GIGANS, Steve Ells. Steve, please. Well, yeah, welcome everyone from GIGANS as well. Uh, yet again, I'd like to thank Perennia for continuing to uh, put on these presentations in coordination with us. It's a great way to get word out to the growers. So um, for our first presentation tonight, I'd like to introduce Kendra McClure. Uh, Dr. Kendra McClure, and uh, she's with Perennia, and she's going to give us some uh, update and information on local virus research and testing. Great. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Francisco, can you let me know if this is uh, looking good? Yes, Kendra. Looks perfect. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, so good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second session of the best management practices. Uh, my name is Kendra, and I'm a colleague of Francisco's at Perennia. And tonight I'm going to be talking about um, Perennia's Plant Health Lab and uh, the grapevine virus screening work that we've been doing for the last few years. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end, but my contact information is there, so you can contact me at any time um, should you have any questions. So to get started, I'm going to first talk about Perennia's Plant Health Lab a little bit because we're a relatively new um, entity. It was established in 2018 and we began offering grapevine virus screening services in the fall of 2018. And since that time, we've doubled our staff and with the hiring of a full-time plant pathologist in the fall of 2019. So now we're able to offer you know, molecular-based diagnostics as well as more classical plant pathology-based diagnostics. So we've developed kind of a holistic local approach to growers' pathogen problems. Now to learn more about the Plant Health Lab, you can go to the main Perennia landing page and click on Lab Services. And there's a tab there um, called Plant Health, and that will direct you to our website, which we're currently updating. But there you can find information about pathogens of concern um, and information like a sample submission form, tips for collecting um, plant samples for submission, and then um, a video about grapevine virus screening and how to, how to sample for that. So please check that out. So we're a team of two specialists that work in the plant health lab. There's myself. Um, I focus on the molecular diagnostic side of things, and then my colleague Sajid, and he focuses on the more um, classical plant pathology diagnostics. And, uh, but you can contact either of us and we'll direct you to um, whoever can help you best, as well as commodity specialists that can help you with your diagnosis afterwards. Okay, so what do I mean by molecular diagnostics and research? So there are some pathogens that present very hallmark features in the field where you can make either a diagnosis in field or you can take samples back to the lab and culture them and look at them under the microscope and be able to determine what bacteria or fungus is causing you a problem based on their structures under the microscope. But there are some diagnoses that are not really discernible by eye, and that's where we go the more molecular approach. So that could be something like pathogen detection, such as viruses, or things like species identification. There's really kind of a, a world of opportunities available once you go the molecular approach. And, um, and these are using molecular biology techniques, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and specifically, we target um, the genome of pathogens of interest. Okay, so I like to show, <laughs> Francis has probably seen this slide a few times now, but I like to show this slide in every presentation I give about viruses and specifically grapevine viruses because it really highlights the difficulties we can have with diagnosis and what I mean by diagnoses that aren't really discernible just by eye. So this multi-panel figure here on the top shows um, grapevines are infected with different viruses. So image A is a vine infected with grapevine red blotch virus. Image B is one infected with grapevine leaf roll associated virus three. And image C is one infected with grapevine leaf roll associated virus one. And if you were to compare the images, it's pretty difficult to tell the difference between the three. Now further complicating that is if you look further into this image here in the other panels, 
We have sources of abiotic and biotic stress that are common in the vineyard that can be mistaken for these. So this is really why we don't suggest diagnosing viruses just by eye and why we go the molecular approach to be quite certain in our diagnosis. A further complication working with um, grapevines is that um, diseases associated with um, viruses don't necessarily present identical sy symptoms across different varieties. So I have the example of grapevine red blotch disease here. And I have it in uh, an example of Cabernet Franc and in Chardonnay. And as you can see in Cabernet Franc, we have kind of the hallmark features that we associate with the name. We have this red blotching that can coalesce into larger patches later in the growing season. But when we look in Chardonnay, we see kind of chlorotic patches or also patches of necrosis. So, and adding another layer to this is when we look at hybrid varieties as well. So you can see this is the same virus that's present in different cultivars and it, it gives more kind of strength to the argument as to why you might want to go the molecular approach in terms of diagnosis. And I'll just um, note too that these photos were provided by our colleague, Dr. Sooth Pajari from Brock University. Okay, so now I'm gonna give a little bit more background information on two diseases that are associated with viruses that we focus on in our lab in particular. The first being grapevine leaf roll disease. This disease is caused by grapevine leaf roll associated virus of which there are several types. I mentioned three and one in the previous slide and those tend to be the most common in our region. And those are the ones we screen for in our lab. So this is a worldwide problem. It's present in most um, growing regions across the, uh, in the world. And it's been present in Nova Scotia at least since the mid 1990s. That's when um, a significant screening um, trial was done, but it could be that it had been present in our province before that time. Now symptoms can vary, but as you can gather from the name, one of the hallmarks is a downward curling of leaves. There can also be leaf discoloration, and more importantly, a reduction in yield and berry quality. And I'd like to pause just now and kind of have a bit of a disclaimer statement. Um, a lot of the research to date has been done in different growing regions um, and has focused a lot on Vitis vinifera. So a lot of the, um, the comments as to the economic impact and even the symptomology you have to keep that in mind that a lot of the research has focused on, on Vitis vinifera so far in other growing regions. So just keep that in the back of your mind. But there are researchers across Canada and in Nova Scotia as well that are studying the implications for the Canadian industry and Nova Scotia's industry as well. So it's thought that this reduction in yield and berry quality is in large part due to a disruptive flow of nutrients within the vines. And once a vine is infected, it will have the virus for the presence of its, of its life. Now it can be spread through infected material such as vegetative propagation and it can also be spread through vectors such as scale insects and mealybugs both of which are present in Nova Scotia. Now um, research in other major growing regions such as New York State, California and Washington State have um, estimated severe economic losses over the lifespan of vineyards that are infected with grapevine leaf roll disease. Now the other major disease I want to talk about is grapevine red blotch disease, which is caused by grapevine red blotch virus. So this is a newly described virus. Its symptoms were first um, described in 2008, but since that time, it's believed that it could have been masquerading as grapevine lethal disease for a large period of time before we realized that it was actually a totally separate virus. But we know it's been present in Nova Scotia at least in the last five years due to work Dr done by Dr. Devereaux, but again, it could be that it has been present longer, but we hadn't been screening for it yet. Again, the symptoms can vary, um, but one of the main hallmark differences between this one and leaf roll is that you don't tend to see that curling of leaves. But again, you do see leaf discoloration, such as red blotches, you can see in the photo here, that can, that can coalesce later in the season in red berried varieties, and then those chlorotic or necrotic regions, like I showed in the previous image of Chardonnay. Again, the main concern about this virus is the reduction in berry quality. And studies have also, some studies have also shown a, a reduction in yield as well. And again, it's thought that these um, reductions in berry quality are associated with disrupted flow of nutrients and there's no cure. And again, spread through infected material and vectors, one of which, um, 
that has been shown through greenhouse studies to be three-cornered alfalfa tree hopper. It's at the bottom here, but it's not yet found in Nova Scotia. It's been suggested that there are lower economic losses associated with red blotch versus leaf roll disease, but um, a little bit of more research is needed. Okay, so I've given you a little bit of background on viruses and how we diagnose them and the two main ones of economic concern in Canada. So what has Perennia been doing to test for them? So we've been working on a virus screening project for the last three years. It started in the summer of 2018 and it's gone until present. And this will be the last year that we'll be screening material. And it's a provincially funded partnership with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, where my main collaborator is Dr. Deb Morell. And to date, they've been focusing on indexing more um, mature established vineyards, whereas our goal was to look at new vines that had been planted under the provincial expansion program. And I'll just make a note here too that um, if you are a grower that has participated in the expansion program and you plan to do vines, we've been trying to get to every participating grower and sample at least one varietal block of each variety planted under the program. So if we've not reached your farm yet, please let me know, please contact me. We have a list of people to see this year, but it could be that, um, that we've missed you and we don't wanna do that. So please contact me. And the viruses that we're screening for are grapevine leaf roll associated viruses one and three and grapevine red blotch virus. And the testing is done at no cost to the grower. We'll come and we'll sample the blocks for you and all the information is confidential. We will be releasing a report at the end of the project that um, growers will have access to, but obviously all the um, identifiers will remain co confidential. Okay, so how do we take samples when we do grapevine virus testing? Um, what you need to keep in mind is that if you sample one vine, you can really only make infer inferences about that one vine. You can't extrapolate to the whole block. So what we do is do, some, is do something where we take composite samples, where we'll test five adjacent vines, pool the leaves and sample that as a pooled sample. And then we take the whole varietal block, we overlay a grid to it, and we'll, we'll take composite samples evenly spaced down the rows and across the rows to get an idea of the virus status for the entire block. So the part of the vines that we target is the basal portion of the vine, or depending on your training system, the portion that has the oldest leaves. And what we do is we go to five adjacent vines and we'll sample four leaves from the basal portion of each vine. So we collect, if your um, row is planted in north to south orientation, two leaves from the west side of the vine, and then reach around and take two leaves from the east side of the vine. And so for a total of 20 samples for a composite sample. Now it's kind of hard to describe using just cartoons. So we have a video on our website if you wanna check out how to take samples yourself um, or you can always talk to me. Okay, so once we have our samples, then we go and do the molecular testing in the lab. So just to remind you again, um, this is what we do when the diagnoses are not discernible by eye. But if you can't see it, how do you know that something's there? Well. With this type of molecular testing, what we're doing is we're targeting the genome of the virus. And we're making inferences that if, if the genome is there or if, a, if the, a genetic signature from the virus is there, then we can assume that that virus has infiltrated the cells of that grapevine, hijacked its cellular machinery, and is using it to produce new proteins that it will use to make new virus particles and to replicate its genome. So it's successfully infected the cell and is spreading throughout the plant. And the way that we detect the, a, you know, a genetic signature from the virus is a molecular biology technique called polymerase chain reaction or PCR analyses, which you may be familiar with in the news lately. It's a similar technique that's used for coronavirus testing. So you can think of taking a nasal swab and determining whether you're positive or negative for coronavirus by detecting the genome of coronavirus. We do that but with leaves instead, but similar kind of concept. And then we infer that the virus is there because its genome wouldn't be there if it were not infected. Okay, so what have we found so far? So these are um, the composite results from three years of testing. And um, you can see along the x-axis here, we've listed the different viruses we've tested for. So there's grapevine leaf roll associated virus one, grapevine leaf roll associated virus three, 
grapevine red blotch virus, and then combinations of these viruses, so co-infections. And then along the uh, y-axis, we can see the percentage of samples that have been infected um, out of our total number of samples, which is 1,877. Um, as you can see, the y-axis thankfully only goes to 16%. <laughs> so um, if we look at the summary of the results, we can see that um, all the viruses were present that we were testing for, but at different degrees. So the most uh, common one was grapevine leaf roll associated virus three, where 15% of all of our samples were positive. Um, and then the second most prevalent was grapevine red blotch virus, where, where about 3% of our samples were positive and then very few were positive for grapevine leaf roll associated virus one and very few samples had co-infections. Um, so keep in mind, this is a composite sample. So it doesn't necessarily mean that one vine was infected with two. It could be that two samples that were pulled together were both singularly infected, but overall these, um, uh, these co-infections were rare. And these results um, are um, similar to what Dr. Moreau has found, that leaf roll three tends to be the most common followed by red blotch and um, other work in Canada too, so. All right, so overall, what, what does this mean in terms of the grapevine testing project? So keep in mind that we are focusing on blocks that have just been planted under the expansion program. So these are new blocks. Um, they haven't been sitting in the ground for ages. Um, so we can infer that these new plantings or this new material is coming in infected and being planted infected and that they have um, grapevine leaf roll associated virus one, three and grapevine red blotch virus. So that's important information to know for our industry, for sure. Um, and we can infer this because we've indexed nearly 10,000 vines. Um, so <laughs> in terms of what this means for the industry, um, with the development, uh, well, with the creation of this project, um, one of the big benefits is that we've developed this, this new service line for the, for the plant health lab, where we now have a local testing option available for growers. So you don't have to send material out of the province to get tested for these viruses. So you, if you feel like you might have a problem on your farm, you can contact Perennia and you can have us come to your farm, sample the vines and give you a diagnosis. And then we can work together with Francisco to help you make faster, more informed management decisions. So. Um, that's a really nice thing to have in our back pocket. Um, in terms of management decisions, I'll touch on that um, briefly here. So anyone that has had their material tested by us, we'll, we send you back a report and then we give you a list of management um, decisions. And, and basically what we're recommending now is to watch the blocks, to monitor them closely for symptoms. Um, you know, around uh, harvest time, are you seeing uneven ripening? Are you seeing you know, differences in terms of, in terms of yield, um, you know, those kind of things, like the, the symptoms I mentioned earlier. Are you seeing any foliar symptoms? And to keep an eye on it. And um, if you have leaf roll in your block, perhaps you want to tr make note of whether you see any of the, of the vectors. But right now, the, the status of the research in our, in our, re in our region is, um, is just kind of beginning. So we need to do more research on what the implications actually are in our growing region with the varieties that we grow before we're gonna make kind of hard, fast, um, you know, management recommendations, such as those that have been, that have been recommended in, in larger growing regions, such as California, where they kind of have thresholds for um, the proportion of, of, of infected material within a block and then kind of what decision you want to make after that. But mostly that's focused on roguing and monitoring and managing um, vectors. But um, I'm not to say that we're not going to have management decisions in the future, but that's, that's just what, where we're at right now. But um, with that in mind, there are researchers in Nova Scotia that are looking at um, how these viruses affect the varieties that are grown here. Um, what are the symptoms that are presented? And then they're also studying the vectors that could be present here as well. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that research coming down the pipeline. Um, but just know that people are working on trying to make, um, are working towards uh, providing you with informed management decisions. So if you want to learn more, um, 
Perennial is releasing a new grape production guide. And in there, we have sections on uh, grapevine viruses that have um, much more detail than what I presented today. We also have some photos in there. So I will ask, I'm not sure when it is um, being released. I'll ask Francisco about that. Um, and then the Plant Health Lab website, which is gonna be updated soon. We have information there about viruses and how to sample. And then another great resource, uh, resource is the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network's website, um, where they have done a series of webinars, excuse me, this winter that focused on red blotch and leaf roll. And they had um, a panelist of international speakers and a large focus on Canada and what is being done in Canada and what people have seen across the country. So I highly recommend watching those. And then the Amafra Grape IPM website is another great resource. Lots of photos, lots of information, but obviously keep in mind, it's focused on Ontario growing conditions. And then again, now that you know, you've either learned about viruses or had a refresher on viruses, you can scout for symptoms you know, later in the season when you're scouting around, getting close to harvest, maybe pay a little bit more attention to you know, some symptoms you might be seeing in, uh, in the canopy or, or in terms of berry ripening. And if you see anything suspect, call us. Um, we're here to help you with anything you need. You can send photos, we can tie it into a site visit. Um, we're here to help, so don't be, don't be shy. Um, so that's my contact information there. As I said, um, contact me at any time with any questions you may have. And one more plug, if um, you participate in the expansion program and we have not visited your farm, please contact me and we'll do our best to see you this summer. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Kendra, for your presentation. Uh, if uh, people have questions, please uh, write in the Q&A. We have already some, some questions for you, uh, Kendra. Sure. Uh, since uh, these viruses are not indigenous to our area, but have been brought, brought in new plantings, why are the vine suppliers permitted to sell these vines that they are infected? Yeah. A real problem um, since there are no cures. Yes. So, um, so the problem with um, trying to control viruses or other pathogens of concern in plant products is that once it's already present and throughout the industry, it, it becomes very, very difficult to control it. And so there are obviously some pathogens of concern and some viruses of concern where there are strict um, import limitations and things like that. But when they went and did this um, kind of initial screening back in the mid 90s, they found that leaf roll was already across the country and it was already in Nova Scotia. So at that point you couldn't really um, control it. So I mentioned briefly the CGCN. Um, so that's an, orga an organization um, in Canada that is trying to um, bolster the industry with sources of virus-free stock. But you need to keep in mind that we grow a lot of different varieties across Canada, and then there's a lot of rootstock combinations as well. So that is going to be a long-term plan, but it's been recognized at the national level that, that that's important for our industry and people are working towards that goal. So I would recommend talking to your um, whoever you're getting plants from and have a discussion about virus and see what they're, um, what they're able to present you with. But um, yeah, it's, it's a very complex, um, large picture. I mean, red blotch disease was only described in 2008, you know, and then we found out what virus was causing it only a few years after that. So some of this stuff is, is really just emerging, you know. The, the last comment, sure, red blotch is more re uh, recent. Just wondering why no standardization of certification? Um, well, so it's more recent, but then uh, the problem is, is that we believe it's, it was kind of masquerading as leaf roll for a long time. So it, we say it's more recent, but um, um, I believe that some work done in California looked at herbarium samples from 50 plus years ago that tested positive for red blotch. So I think for just a long time, there wasn't, people weren't discerning the two. And so who knows how long red blotch has been around for, but it's probably been around for a Quite a decent amount of time as well. So again, you have that same problem where it's established, it's planted, you know, 
in numerous blocks, how do you eradicate it? It's uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would really like to compliment what you said, Kendra, that about CTCN. They are currently working towards that direction to have mm -hmm. a clean plant material. This is a worldwide issue, Kendra already explained. So we have to start and taking all the, the measurements to, to be able to produce our clean material. And we have already nurseries that they are producing. Yeah. I don't believe that there are any resistant rootstocks. And I don't believe there's any naturally occurring resistance present in any type of grape variety, um, no, unfortunately. No, it doesn't exist. I mean, and, they, and it's present in, you know, they can infect wild vinifera as well. Um, so, I mean, it could be that it's hiding out there somewhere. Um, but plant breeders haven't found it yet. And, the, and then the, compl the complication is to try to bring resistance into a commercially viable or a, you know, a commercially important variety, right? Like it's, it would have to be new varieties or it'd have to be genetic engineering, which is a whole other you know, conversation, but yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kendra, for, for your time, for the presentation yeah. and to answer these questions. It's something quite important. Uh, Kendra contact information uh, was presented, but you can find more about her in the webpage of, of Perenia and, and to get more, more insights of, of virus disease. Thank yeah. you very much, yeah. Kendra. No problem. Well, we'll continue with the presentation before moving forward to with uh, Jeff Franklin. Uh, I, I, Really appreciate all the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. And I would like to encourage you to use the feature on the bottom, the Q&A. If you have more questions, please uh, write uh, there and we can uh, continue uh, asking to, to the presenters. Now, as a classical of these events, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Jeff Franklin, who will be giving like a, a climate update of the last couple of weeks. Jeff. Well, thanks for inviting me back to speak on this again. Just give me a second while I uh, share my screen. So how does that look? Can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes. So again, uh, thanks uh, for having me back tonight. It's uh, good to speak on this again. Um, I'm gonna give you an update, uh, mainly on, on the same sort of uh, slides that I've showed you before. Uh, some of the basic features of uh, of climate. Uh, so the picture I include this first slide. That's a a, a picture of a Lacadie flower inflorescence taken today. So so th things are moving along quite rapidly. The last couple of days of, of heat have really made a difference. Oops. Fast. So let's just start talking about uh, temperatures. So this is a graph of uh, mean daily temperatures plotted from 1st of January this year, right up to yesterday. And again, the gray line in the middle is the trend line, a 10 year trend line. It, it's what we would expect the temperatures to be uh, at, at any given point uh, along this, this time frame. Um, and, and so we can sort of look at times when we're above or below average or at the average. So as you can see, we started off the year above average, a brief period of winter where we went below average, back to above average and average. And then just uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've gone, we've gone back here to above average. And you can see the, the two, um, two most extreme points here uh, were the, the last two days of above 30 degree weather. So that's, that's really pushed things along quite a bit. Uh, we've had um, a good accumulation of heat and that heat is, uh, is, is driving the phenology to the, the point that we are today. So I've also put on this, this plot where we first saw buds begin to swell. Uh, that happened late April and went on to about the middle of May and then a, a reasonable uh, almost two weeks of, of bud break um, across various cultivars. So we, we measure bud break in our vineyard. We have you know, one of the earliest varieties, Marquette, and one of the slower varieties, Riesling. So that when I that the span of that bud break line uh, is, is sort of looking at bud break across, you know, those varieties uh, for all for all the buds to have made it through bud break, and of course the, the next next major stage is flowering. Uh, when flowering is going to begin, I'm going to touch on that here in a couple of slides. 
So looking at temperatures is one thing, but uh, more interesting from an agricultural perspective is heat. Um, how much heat have we accumulated? Because there's a direct correlation between the amount of heat that we receive and, and uh, the amount of development in both plants and insects. So what I'm showing here are growing degree days calculated using the average method um, and with a base of 10 degrees. And once we get past bud break, a base of 10 degrees is more appropriate uh, uh, to measure development or as a proxy for development. So uh, this year, 2021 is the thick red line and the dotted black line in the middle is the 10 year average. So we've kind of moved around back and forth, uh, close to the average and above the average, and sometimes a little bit behind the average. But overall, we've been accumulating heat units constantly since, since late April. And we've just, as you can see with that line right here at the very end, uh, goes quite a bit steeper. Uh, that's the incredibly warm weather that we've seen, that we received uh, end of May and early June. And if, if you think back to last year, you can kind of see it. The blue line is, is sort of last year's um, accumulated heat units. We did a similar thing. Um, we had some cool weather in May and that changed to uh, some very warm weather, late May and early June and, and things really skyrocketed. And that's, uh, we're kind of seeing a similar pattern this year, although with a much shorter cool period in May. Along with that, we look at uh, cumulative precipitation. Uh, so this looks at uh, not just rainfall, but rainfall and uh, uh, the rainfall equivalent from snowfall. And so this year we've trended for the most of the year, again, it's, it's the thicker red line, uh, average to below average. Uh, we received less precipitation in the winter than we normally do. And, but we, early May, we began to catch up. And right now we're hovering very close to average precipitation. Which is, which is good news for people that are trying to plant. Uh, there's, and I myself in the middle of planting, there's a good amount of moisture present in the soil. Um, so less stress on the vines and, and quicker bud break when those vines are put in. We never know how long this is going to hold out, uh, but looking at the long-term forecast, uh, early next week, we may be in for 20 to 30 millimeters of rain over a couple of days, which would be good. It'd be good to replenish that and, and get as, to, you know, stay as close to the average line as possible. Because we know, and you can, you can pretty well take it to the bank from July and August, we will get half the rainfall or less per month of what we will get uh, in the spring, April, May, and early June. So again, the, this all looks very good. Temperatures are good, cumulative precipitation is good. Uh, again, uh, so, so this is soil temperatures, also taken from the Kempfel Research Station, and I'll remind you that all the data that I'm showing here comes from the Kempfel Research Station. So we also measure soil temperatures at approximately 35 uh, centimeters, uh, about, about a foot down. Uh, and soil temperatures don't always follow perfectly air temperatures. Air temperature is one of the factors, but this time of year, the, the major, uh, major factor for determining soil temperatures or what causes soil temperatures to increase is the amount of solar radiation. We've had some very good periods of, of sunny weather and warm weather. And if you follow that, that red line along through to uh, uh, yesterday when I accumulated this data, it's, it's done a, a similar thing that, that the uh, average temperature is done, that the heat units have done all of a sudden, you know, right around the first of June, we've got this spike, this incredible upward surge. And so we're looking at uh, 30 centimeters, which is, you know, a good proxy for where the root zone would be in grapes. We've got uh, soil temperatures at around 18 degrees, which is very good, very good for nutrient uptake. In some years, uh, and 2019 being the classic uh, example, we didn't have uh, very warm temperatures uh, shortly after we applied our fertilizers, uh, shortly after the buds were breaking and we were getting shoots. We didn't have good soil temperatures and that probably resulted in those years in poorer nutrient uptake, especially early in the season uh, when there's a lot going on at the level of the plant, where we really want those nutrients to be present. So again, I see this as another very positive sign Warm soils, warm air temperatures, lots of solar radiation, good precipitation. So that's all good news. Uh, let's talk a little bit about phenology. Um, so these are pictures I took uh, this morning. So as of June 10th, so the Marquette shoot on the left, Marquette would be um, analogous to uh, Lucy Kuhlman, um, Back on Noir, uh, Leon Milo. So these, these uh, varieties break early. 
And so we use that as kind of our proxy for earliest development of grapes. So the Marquette shoot on the left, uh, that's that's the ninth leaf I've got circled at the top. Uh, there's actually one in, hidden behind that leaf is another one that's a poke to break. So I did find a few Marquette shoots with uh, 10 leaves present. So that that's fairly advanced for this time of year. Uh, the Lacadie shoot on the right hand side, that's the seventh leaf that, that's broken. So um, again, it's a little bit behind the Marquette, uh, but you know, certainly, certainly well along. Um, so when I, when I look at these two and I compare them to last year, and I, I like to use last year, last year was a very good year, very lots of positives for, for growing grapes in Nova Scotia. But based on the phenology of last year, we're approximately seven days ahead uh, this year from where we were uh, this time last year in terms of phenology. So our vines are about, have about seven days of extra growth. On them. Again, uh, some years, I mean, this, when we measure these things early on, things, if, if we continue to get heat or if we were to lose our heat, that would slow down. But, but as it stands right now, about seven days ahead. And, and looking on to the next major stage, uh, flowering. Flowering is the next major stage that we're, that we're going to hit. And so again, I, I've taken these, these same two varieties, Marquette and Lacadie, and, and look at their the development of the flowers. So before we get to true flowering, the true point of grace where we can say flowering has begun, the flowers, uh, the, the bundles, the clusters of, of individual flowers have to separate out. And we can see in Marquette on the left that this is, this is happening, this is well underway. Um, although there's not very many singles in there, but uh, uh, certainly we're getting close. And you can see the beginning of the development of the cap on the ends of those flowers. So. Uh, that, that's, that's certainly a very, very advanced and not that far from, from the beginning of official flowering. If you look to the right, uh, looking at the Lacadie Blanc, they're still uh, a, a very tight, compact group. So, so they've got uh, a bit more time yet. But based on how we saw things progress last year and the timing between the various stages, I think that um, for varieties like Marquette, uh, we will be in official flowering um, as early as next week. And just as another comparison, I know I don't have, I'm showing hybrids here, I don't have a lot of vinifera shown here, but when I looked at our Chardonnay today, we also have Chardonnay in our, our vineyard, um, they're about at the same uh, number of leaves out as the Lacadie, they're running seven or eight leaves, and their clusters look, their flower clusters look very similar to what I'm, the picture here on the right of the Lacadie. So I don't see much timing difference this year between our Chardonnay and our Lacadie, maybe other people in other sites are I've seen it differently, but uh, I see them being very tight this year. And they're not every year, but certainly this year is a case where, where, where they are. So looking a little farther down the road, um, I don't know if anybody uses this product, but uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada has their seasonal modeling where they look at temperature precipitation. They, they make a forecast, you know, several months out. So I often look at the, at the, the 90 day or the three month forecast um, and it changes from month to month. They put a new one out every month. So this is the one from uh, early June, and it forecasts for June, July, and August. And if you if you look here, let me point it out with my pointer. Uh, so this area in here is Atlantic Canada, and as you see, it's distinctively redder than everywhere else in Canada. And so what they're assigning to Nova Scotia is the highest probability, between 90 and 100 percent chance that we're going to see an above average temperatures for the period of June, July, and August. And if you think back a year ago, uh, I put up this exact same forecast. Uh, they were suggesting the same thing. And of course, that's exactly what we got. Now I have found with this product that even though they're, they're, they're predicting for three months uh, in, in all fairness, uh, the forecast is the most accurate for that first uh, month of that, of that prediction. And it, it weakens a little bit into the second and third, but, but nonetheless, it looks very promising for, not only do we have a bit of an advantage now that we're probably going to maintain that throughout the summer uh, and hopefully on through grazing and uh, with, with a little luck on through harvest as well. So that's all I have. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, please, if somebody has any questions.
quite interesting the data, Jeff. It's nice to see how it's the heat accumulation and how it has been the, the precipitation as well. We have a question for you. Any forecast for precipitation? So there is a forecast for precipitation. I often don't like to show it because it is, uh, I don't find that it's a very strong, it's very difficult to predict precipitation. And plus we're, we're moving into the summer precipitation pattern where precipitation is very local. So, uh, you know, we can talk about overall, maybe, uh, you know, 25 millimeters a month, but, but we'll have places here in the valley that will see twice that and places that will see half that. So I tend, I tend not to put a lot of uh, advertising. That, that uh, forecast is available from the Environment um, Canada Climate Change site. Uh, and you, you certainly, certainly can take a look at that. I, I, I shy away from it a little bit because I found it not to be all that uh, deterministic. I've got a question for Jeff, if I can jump in, Francisco. Please, go ahead. Uh, on, uh, when you were showing the phenological stages, Jeff, um, you were saying about seven days ahead of last year. What's that for the average, like uh, over the five to ten year average? Where are we? So saying? if if I look at heat units, uh, and you're right, I didn't I didn't really explain that well. If I look at heat units as we've calculated them, we're probably six seven days ahead of of the average for heat units. I can't give you that same uh, prediction for phenology because we've only tracked phenology tightly in our vineyard for one year. So all I can tell you is that we're also seven days ahead of where we were in our vineyard last year. Um, uh, whether or not last year is a good proxy for an average year, uh, I, I can't tell you. I, I think it probably was at some points, but it, it's, if you remember right, it started off way behind and very quickly proceeded to well in advance. So it crossed the average line in there at some point. But I can tell you at this point, we're, we're running about seven days ahead in, in the actual physical development of the, of the plants, and also coincidentally, six to seven days ahead in the measurement of heat units. So, so they do seem to be tightly co coupled. The, the progress of the crop is quite tightly correlated to the uh, heat units at this point. One more question. Associated lectures one and two, what does higher temperature effect have on the spread of grapevine viruses? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back away from that, let Kendra speak. <laughs> um, I, th I think that the link you could probably make is how temperature affects vector populations is how I would maybe link the two. Um, Beyond that, I don't know uh, if any work has really been done on how temperature affects the, uh, I, I think it would have to do with the, uh, how temperature affects the insect vectors, that being the scale insects and mealy bugs and leaf roll and uh, three cornered alfalfa leaf hopper, tree hopper, sorry, <laughs> Jeff, don't tell Deb, <laughs> um, uh, um, in a red blotch. Uh, I know that it's caused the aphids on my hanging baskets to just explode the temperatures in the last few days. <laughs> Certainly, I, I would suggest since, since plants draw all their, you know, the, the speed of reactions that goes on in plants is, is determined by the ambient temperature. And so I would expect that within a plant, the virus probably propagates faster in warmer temperatures. But um, again, I, I know of no studies that would suggest that. Uh, as soon as all reactions in, in a plant are driven by Heat to a certain degree, uh, I suspect the virus is coupled to that as well. But yeah, the, the, the last question was: so the insect vectors like the higher temperature uh, more? Oh, I you know I I would direct that question to to Dr. Morrell, um in terms of uh, yeah how the heat affects um yeah how the heat affects scale insects and mealybugs in particular. Um, it def it would maybe affect the number of generations, um, but. I, I would yield that question to her. That is definitely her wheelhouse. And she's actively doing research on, on the vectors affecting that can spread um, these viruses in Nova Scotia currently. And Dr. Steph Moreau can confirm that yes, vectors are favored by high temperatures. Well, if we don't have any more questions, thank you very much, Jeff. 
for the nice update. And I also want to say this very out loud that thank you very much for all the information that you are providing us weekly. So we can update in the great blog all the graph and provide some information to, to all the growers. And that's a good point, Francisco, and, and you should be tooting your horn a little more on that. Uh, I know that came out of a GGANS meeting, a, a request for um, more constant updates on heat units and everything, and you jumped right on that. And I've enjoyed the last three weeks getting my great blog and being able to track the heat units and, and precipitation and everything. That, that's that's really great. So really appreciate you doing jumping on that so fast. So, um, so now I'd like to uh, introduce our next presenter, our viticultural specialist from Perennia. Francisco is going to bring us up to date on what we should be doing on the vineyard right now. Thank you, Steve. I hope everybody can see my, my presentation. Uh, Good evening, everyone. My name is Francisco Diaz. I'm the viticulture specialist. And today I want to mention a couple of vineyard activities. So for today, I will be talking a little bit about the season 2021. Uh, already Jeff gives something, it will be very brief. Also something very important as uh, Sharon asked and also Dr. Demoro has answered the, the insects or diseases. So scouting the vineyard, how and where to look. And oversee some activities like weed management, desaccharine and tacking. A couple of these, I know you have already doing it, but it's always uh, nice to remind. And as already Jeff explained, uh, it's coming quite soon and faster as we want a bloom. So tissue sample for nutritional management purposes will be very crucial. And after we'll finish with the discussion as, as always. So season 2021, the seasonal growth. Uh, in average, or depending on the location, the bad burst started approximately on May 14. So if I compare the date of 2021 with 2020, it's very interesting the difference. Last year, the season started approximately on May 24. So we have 10 days of difference when start this phenological stage. The last couple of weeks, again, even if it sounds redundant, presented good temperatures and moisture in the soil. So this has accelerated a lot the growth in the last couple of weeks. So already you can see some vineyards started the, the tacking and bloom will start earlier uh, than last year, definitely. So, Similar to the last time, I would like to be uh, interacting a little bit with you. So I will launch a polling question. And this is, when was your bad burst? And I have a couple of options from May 12 to May 18. This is our anonymous um, uh, poll. So please, I encourage you to, to answer the, the these poll questions. And we put a big range because it depends a lot of the variety and also the location. So I wouldn't be surprised to, to see a different values. Usually when we are providing some numbers uh, online, it's as Jeff said, or they are coming from a specific place. For example, the climatic information, the Kendo Research Station. So it's difficult to generalize. Every site will have a different uh, phenology. So it, it's, it's, it's difficult to make the, the link. Well, I have a couple of questions, so I will end the polling and I will share the results this time. My apologies for the last time. So when was uh, your bad burst? Well, many places started on May 12th, uh, 43%. Uh, 29% on May 16, and with 14% May 14 and May 17. So scouting vineyard. Scouting the vineyard. So how? Well, we have to identify growth stages, a variety, and the area. So different varieties will have a different disease susceptibility. Not all the varieties, for example, 
Marquette will be much stronger than Pinot Noir. So it's important to, to, to keep that in mind. Identify the areas of the vineyard with symptoms. If you already had records of areas with the, uh, these issues, that can happen in the future. Also track date and the weather conditions just to know how has been the, the, the progression of the season and how this has been affected the plants. If you have some kind of damage on the vine, and a description of the damage so you can uh, know how it's. And the scouting, it can be done one to two times per week. So here's coming my second conclusion. How frequent are you scouting? So it can be every two weeks, one time per week, two times per week, three times per week, and more than three times per week. Again, this is anonymous, so please go ahead to, to answer. Nobody will know. I will repeat the question is how frequent are you scouting? Every two weeks, one time per week, two times per week, three times per week, or more than three times per week. I will give a couple more seconds. I will stop and I will share the results with you. So the results is 50-50, 50% for one time per week, 50% for more than three times per week. It is interesting to see the, the different strategies. So where, where to look? Well, the priority on the most susceptible varieties. This has to be the priority and the areas with less airflow and wet spots. So attention to wind directions and depressions through the vineyard so we can choose and prioritize that areas. Keep notes uh, of the areas with your observations and check different parts of the vine. So for example, in these two pictures, we can see how we are looking the top part of the, the, the vine, the leaf, and also the, the back part. So we have some very uh, nice information and I would like to encourage you to, to, to check different uh, guides. One is the guide to the key arthropods of vineyards of Eastern Canada. And the other is the identification guide of the major disease of grapes. So you can see diseases such as powder mildew, dairy mildew, or insects such as phylloxera. All this information will be shared with you guys uh, through the grape blog. So no worries to be searching this information. It will be shared with everybody in, in, through the grade block. So some, some diseases to pay attention and to compare with the powdery and downy mildew, and also to be aware of which is phylloxera and which is uranium mite. Yes, to, to, to be careful of what are you applying to the vineyard and to take the, the proper measure. So the activities. We have wheat management already has been moving quite fast. Uh, the season with a lot of humidity and a lot of heat. So I can imagine you have seen a lot of weeds everywhere. So keep weeds under control between the root and beneath. Uh, the vines is very important to diminish the competition. Yeah, and also it's avoiding the weed establishment so they don't uh, choke the, the, the vines. And we have to pay an extra attention to the new vineyards. So diminishing competition and it can be as you can see in these two pictures, having a nice cover crop. So only the cover crop will keep under control the weeds and the, the, the rows you can see how are, are very clean. So clean beneath the vine, like one feet for each side, it will be very good, especially for new vines. So you diminish the competition and they can grow. The green, well, this is the process. Uh, of removing small shoots, secondary buds, and shoots from the trunk, and diminish the competition of energy, nutrients, and water. Also, will improve the airflow in the canopy, and it will consider your your production uh, conditions. So, for example, how was the bud break? You had a very good bud break. Ah, okay, you have to be stronger with the desaccharin, or if you have less, you will have to take another decision. And how much production is estimated? Because you remember each bat, it can give you like average, of course, depending on the variety, like two bunches. 
So here, I would like to ask you another question. How is the desaccharine going? So the options are 0% done. We haven't done because it's not necessary. 24% done, 50% done, 75% done, or 100% done. Okay. So I know many people have been moving through and depending on the condition of your, your place, you can be applying this technique or not. Okay, so again, I will repeat the, the question is how is the, uh, the saccharine going? And the options are 0%, 20%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. Okay, so I have enough, I will show the results. So how is going? Well, 13% uh, haven't done, 38% has the 50% done, 25 is the 75% uh, done, and we have another 25% uh, with the 100% done, okay? So everything depends on each location and which is your production conditions. So here I would like to highlight two small uh, plants. And here you can see the secondary and tertiary and secondary, they, they have to be eliminated. In this other case, well, we have the shoots and we have two uh, shoots growing quite close. So we have to take a decision. In this case, we took the decision to eliminate the left. And you can see you have the space. So in that way, the shoots, they can grow quite straight. And once we have the, the fruit zone and the bunches, they will not be uh, close or uh, avoiding to, uh, to have a uh, like botrytis. In this case, then didn't work this. We have a, a, a new vine with a lot of, a lot of uh, shoots coming all around. We took the decision to clean this part. So the trunk is quite clean and we have a couple of options to be growing through the, the growing season. Uh, tucking, that's another uh, important activity and it will be a variety priority. First, the early varieties, of course, you have to be moving depending on what is growing faster. And this will be complementary to, to the saccharine and will facilitate activities as improve spray applications. It will be a better canopy uh, aeration and the fruit area will be in good conditions. So this is very brief, just to show the options that you can uh, see or you can take in your vineyard, having the, the wire position on the top or having the wires on the bottom. Finally, the tissue sampling bloom, a bloom is coming quite fast. So it's uh, important to remind this, we have two timings for sampling, one is bloom and the other is variation. And it's important to keep an eye in these stages uh, because we have, and we have to choose the varieties and the areas. I think Jeff already said, maybe Marquette or Lucy Kuhlman will come quite soon. So it will be a good timing to be planning uh, once we have the 50% of bloom, uh, the tissue is something. Dorenia has a fact sheet and, and a video. Of, uh, it's available from Cornell University. Again, both materials will be available in the next publication of the great blog with the other guides. So it's important to keep in mind, this is the leaf blade and the petiole, both uh, are the leaf, but you want, this is the sample uh, uh, complete. And usually you want to choose and separate the petiole from the blade, okay? If you have to decide priority, it's, it's the petiole. So here is my last question for you. So when are you tissue sampling? And the options are bloom, the raisin, both, or depending on the season. Depending on the, the person, you can take a, a different decision of, of when you want to be doing the, the tissue sample. So because it's, uh, it's not possible to see the question after uh, if you want to rewatch the video, is when are you tissue sampling? It's options bloom, the raisin, both, or depending on the season. Please answer the questions. These are completely anonymous. Nobody will, will see the names, anything. I will give other 15 more seconds. When are you tissue sampling? 
bloom, duration, both, or depending on the season. Okay, so we'll finish. Share the results with you. When are you tissue sampling? We have a 83% at both, uh, bloom and duration, and we have a 17% at bloom. So now I would like to give the, to welcome uh, Marcel Kolb and Steve uh, Els to discuss a little bit about a, a couple of these of observations and how is the, the season is. That's a little bit of what we have been already discussing. One moment, please. My apologies, I must close the session. Um, Marcel, because you are yes. mute, so sorry. <laughs> I would like to start with you. Uh, how do you look at the beginning of the season, your main observations, and about the, the weed management until now with this high humidity and, and heat units? So yes, in the last uh, session, we were talking about how we were thinking we might slide sli uh, into a 2017 year, um, which uh, the cooler nights and have definitely uh, done us in on that end. But uh, I would say we're close to uh, very, very close to what last year was, uh, date-wise at least. Um, I'm thinking uh, or I'm agreeing with uh, Jeff on that one. We most likely in earlier varieties will see a few blooms starting next week, um, uh, but mainly uh, I would think about 50% average throughout the vineyard. Uh, I would say targeting somewhere 27th of June, so it's about the same as last year. Um, uh, grass is growing, weeds are growing, vines are growing. Uh, it's a fun time <laughs> right now with just everything going at the same time. Um, of course, there's never enough hands right now in the vineyard, so uh, everything is a little bit stressful. Um, but we love the job, so that's why we do it. And uh, it's interesting to see how nature is uh, progressing right now in a, in a really fast manner. But overall, the vineyards look great and I'm, and I'm hoping we're gonna have a really good bloom and, uh, and a good set. Perfect, thank you, Marcel. And You're welcome. Are you on the same page with, uh, with Marcel? Yeah, I think we're we're pretty much there. I think uh, I think we're definitely a little ahead of last year, um, somewhere between last year and seventeen. I think is kind of the, where we're seeing most of the stuff develop. Uh, and yeah, it, it's amazing these last hot days. I mean, we're ticking off one or two phenological stages a day. It almost seems. And uh, um, yeah, and and the one thing i'm noticing this year and i don't know if you are marcel but i really see a tightening up between the different varieties i there's not the difference between we usually think of pinot being kind of a week behind everything else or maybe even a little more than that and um really as far as leaves on phenological stages were not very much different and um, chardonnay is about the same as lacadie right now um so I, I really i've seen a tightening up between the varieties, which is even creating a bigger headache for me, because usually uh, with bud thinning and, and shoot selection and desuckering and all that, and then rolling into, you can kind of start it with your early hybrids and roll into the vinifera and kind of then it rolls right back. You start over again with the tucking and wire moving, but um, this year, everything's just hitting us all at once. So um, we're pretty much through uh, shoot selection, suckering stuff. We've kind of had to prioritize a little bit. Some of it's looking a little crazy out there, but it's uh, like our front neck uh, variety. We usually just kind of clean up the trunk. We don't do quite as intense of a thinning and, and shoot selection on it. So it's kind of been walked away from for now. And even though it's an early, uh, early hybrid variety and we're really concentrating on trying to finish up the vinifera before they get too crazy. But uh, and, and the grass is crazy. I've never seen grass go this fast, this crazy in the vineyard before. And I don't know if it's the perfect combination of moisture and, and heat, but um, 
the great po is going nonstop and and uh we're doing a little rototilling out there too and and it's it's crazy it's uh, we're having a tough time keeping up with that but but the, the vines look good um i think we have a good you know we're still looking at a, a how they're developing is good and you know we're looking at the inflorescence to see if we have healthy vines and um you know we're already seeing those three really nice almost same size inflorescences uh developed on the lacadie and and some of those hybrids the a lot most of the vinifera already has two really nice uniform um inflorescence out on each cluster out on each shoot so uh i think there's a lot of positives so far for sure but uh it's so far it's a tough year to keep up with things marcel because Steve already mentioned the desaccharine and the, the tacking. How is everything with you in your side? Yeah, we're, we're uh, about 90% uh, uh, done uh, with the desaccharine. Um, it's going a little bit slower in areas where we decided to try some spur proning um, just to save ourselves a little bit more time. But I know by summer we're going to be paying for it double. Um, so it's uh, uh, we're trying to to get through uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, good right now, just to pay extra attention to it, so we save ourselves maybe a little bit time in the summer. Um, so uh, uh, and then after the desaccharine, yes, uh, it's hard to decide right now which where to start with the uh, first round of tucking because everything looks just the same right now. So um uh yeah so but definitely some of the hybrids uh i've seen already some shoots falling over um in some of the hybrids uh so we're always already seeing that the wind definitely does a number right now too um so we're, we're definitely going to be jumping and moving wires uh probably even tomorrow yeah okay perfect very fast are you in the same with the tacking steve yeah, we started yesterday, uh, so we tend to focus. It's an early variety anyway, but we tend to focus on Lacadie off the off the start. Um, it seems to be it breaks a little easier. Um, some of our other ver early varieties like uh, Geisenheim or Frontenac seem to be a little more pliable in the wind, a little more forgiving. So we always tend to focus on Lacadie first. Um, but it's it's crazy because um, I mean there's we've got blocks of Chardonnay that we could tuck right now we could move the wires down to the first position so uh, there's yeah there's going to be some tough choices to make coming up but uh, we're trying to get through it and, and it's that's one of the things of scouting right is to identify maybe you're not always going to do it on that standard approach of hybrids first vinifera second uh, later varieties of vinifera last, you know, you really got to scout around and say, Ooh, what absolutely has to be done today or tomorrow? <laughs> yes, same here. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, definitely going to be a different year. Uh, it's not <laughs> going to be a, ge a general approach like we used to. Um, it's definitely going to be different. So Marcel, I know this is your favorite topic. How you are approaching with the spray applications? Because yes, it's growing everything so fast. A bloom in the earliest varieties are coming super fast. So how are you taking your strategies? In there? Uh, so we had a pretty clean year last year. So we went into, uh, into our year pretty relaxed with a really relaxed program. Uh, not as uh, not as tight uh, like the last two years, so we we started off a little bit later, um, and uh, of course the scouting is going on uh, on a daily basis just to make sure with that humidity that we had uh, that there is nothing nothing happening out there on our leaves. Um, but uh, we did uh, we did put on a uh, just one spray so far, and that was just our general pre bloom. Uh, with, with some extra nutrition to help for bloom. Um, depends on what next week happens. Maybe, uh, maybe there is time for a small second one uh, before bloom just to be on the safe side. Um, but so far it looks uh, pretty good out there. Okay. And, and Steve, are you taking a similar strategy? Uh, how looks everything on your side? Pretty much. So we've got uh, one spray on everything, two on some. 
Um, kind of same thing. It's a lot of scoting and it's changed a little bit just with last year being so clean. We actually didn't do a dormant spray this year just because everything was so clean from last year. So kind of identified a cost savings there. We didn't feel it was really necessary. Um, and we scoted pretty hard on that, looking at the wood as we were tying down and, and made that decision. Um, kind of like Marcel, uh, one of the sprays was on the hybrids was no fungicide at all. It was just uh, kind of that pre-bloom package, boron, iron, magnesium, stuff like that, which goes back to looking at our tissue samples from last year and kind of what we think we need. Um, and yeah, we're looking at probably doing that kind of pre pre-bloom fungicide as soon as the rain's over this coming week. We'll probably try to get in there and, and we'll do another uh, micronutrient package and then um, fungicide on probably most everything be, just so we get through bloom with uh, protection everywhere. Perfect. I, 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 it's interesting. You have to be ahead of everything, what is happening and providing the good nutrition so we can have a nice pollination and we can have a food clusters and a good crop this year. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say if if you're going to do one spray a year, I would do it pre-bloom. Like that's, you know, if, if you're going to cut back on fungicide at any time, pre-bloom wouldn't be the one I would cut back on. It's, that's setting up your crop for the whole rest of the thing. That's a, and, and even the hybrids that are really resistant, uh, I think bloom is possibly the most delicate time of the year for them. And I think Marcel and I have talked about this before, and I think we're in line yeah. on this. It's, that's the, the one to really concentrate on if, if uh, you're going to do anything. Yeah. If you, if you just do one spray right a year, then do the one pre blue. <laughs> yes, just to be sure, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> we have one question from, the, from somebody, so I would like to, to share with you guys. I had been selecting shoots and the suckering at the same time. Uh, is there a risk of bringing up disease from the soil or should I do those jobs separately? Uh, we usually do them together. It's, it's cuts down on a pass. I mean, it depends how much you're doing, I guess, but we would certainly uh, try to do most of that desuckering and, and shoot selection in one pass at this early stage. Yeah, same, same here. It's, it's all about time saving and getting as many things done at once that you can. Yeah. yeah. Another one with uh, shoot selection, shoot thinning, whatever you want to call it. Um, th this is something that can save you a little pain later on about uh, by this time, you're kind of seeing how much of a crop you're going to get, uh, how good your shoots are, how good your inflorescence are. Um, this is the time to maybe if you're shoot selecting anyway, to decide how much crop you want on those vines, depending if they're variety and quality level and, and uh, age of the vine and everything, but you can shoot select a, a little harder and maybe not have to cluster thin later on. And it's way quicker to knock a shoot off right now than it is to try to get in there and take one shoot, one cluster per vine off. So that's, that's something that, that we kind of think about with some of our vines. Yes, absolutely. And if there is always questions about uh, how much crop you should leave on and what quality is expected, the winery usually is able to help you with uh, answering those questions or even uh, show you a good and easy way how to uh, select those shoots to have the right amount of crop at the end of the year. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you said that, Marcel. It's good to be communicating with the, the, yes. the winery because with the winery, you will be able to to take a decision depending on which is the, the wine aim to, to be done at the end of the season. So, well, I think we touched the, the main points. We wanted to know how was the beginning of the season, how has been the development, the desaccharine, the shoot thinning. And for me, which is quite important is the spraying because you have to be all the time ahead to be preventing of what it can happen. And especially about the nutrients because now we want to be sure that the plant has a good balance has a good boron, good zinc, so we can have a, well, and good iron, actually, it's everything, the micros as well, and the, the, the clusters that can be quite complete at the end of this stage. And also to remind about the, the, the tissue sampling, because thanks to this, we can be tweaking a little bit uh, through the season. 
So what are you thinking this time of the year, Francisco, about um, uh, fertility? Or would you be adding a little bit of fertility at this time? I think it would be depending on uh, if, if we have some records from, from previous uh, years. Uh, for what I have seen in, in many places, some applications of iron, it would be very beneficial. Boron, because usually the, the soils in Nova Scotia are quite poor in boron, wouldn't harm small doses. Again, it depends if you have historical data, a tissue sampling that can show you that your area has a low values and, and maybe some, uh, depending if it's, you don't have a lot of vigor and your plants are looking a little yellowish, maybe some application of foliar nitrogen wouldn't harm neither. Uh, the, we have the last question. It's please comment on the potential negative impacts of precipitation at bloom, fruit set, and how that might impact thinning selection. Well, certainly you don't want a big giant rain right at bloom, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah I, you can leave a little bit more on. I mean, generally speaking, we have lots of crop on. Um, so it's uh, and certainly a downy, downy is a big concern of ours. If you get a big rain on and it's hot, um, we're really concerned. That's why it's so important to get that protection on. Uh, certainly a, a big rain can interfere with the set process, but uh, my bigger concern would be actually downy mildew and having that protection on there to protect against it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, a big rain during bloom is definitely never good to have, um, hence uh, to have that, uh, uh, that pre-bloom spray on in time uh, for the duration of bloom. Um, well, with, uh, I mean, even if we get rain during bloom, usually it's never too, uh, too harsh on the, on the clusters. Um, I've never actually, I don't think I've ever seen a, a big loss, uh, here, uh, over the years, um, because of rain. Um, we've seen some numbers dwindling because of high humidity. Um, that's definitely also another, another factor to think about, but also high humidity brings disease. So, uh, there might be more loss towards the end of the season because of it. Um, if you want to think about, uh, not, uh, shoe thinning right now, um, just because you're thinking you might lose some, um, uh, some, fruit uh, volume during uh, during bloom because of rain then i don't think uh, that is a step um, to take uh, i mean do the shoot thinning now uh, don't select maybe too harsh uh, depending on the the crop load that you think you can bear and what uh, the winery actually wants um, and uh, and then maybe post bloom when you see how the fruit set is then go in and start selecting the, the shoots that you want to keep and then start uh, lowering the number of, uh, of, uh, of volume on the, on the vine. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, have, I just want to complement what you have said. It's very crucial and important to have the good applications on time. And what it can happen if it's a lot of precipitation? Well, maybe some uh, berries, they will have abortion. The bunches, they will be a little looser. And depending on the varieties, some varieties are more prone to have this uh, situation. For example, Chardonnay has a tendency to have abortion, so the cluster can be a little looser. So if we have high precipitation, that it can happen, you will have lighter uh, uh, bunches. But, and I am agree with Marcel, it shouldn't be so crucial about the, the, the shoot selection just to, to, to think in only that, because overall we help to manage the vineyard through through the rest of the season. But I think nutritional deficiencies and disease would be a much bigger concern than physical damage from a rain. I think physical damage from a rain isn't isn't a super high on the list concern at, at Bloom. And even 
thinning out before that, it, it's going to mean that they're, they're going to dry off a little quicker and your spray is going to hit better. You, you get those ones that are on top of each other. You don't get the spray coverage. It's, we say it all season long, right? It's the same as deleafing and tucking. Get them so you can hit them good with the spray. And, and it even goes back to this time of year to a certain extent. So. Okay, gentlemen, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Dr. Kendra McClure, just to finish. Kendra, I don't know if you, you want to answer a, a last question. Yeah, sure. So there was a question in the chat there about um, the fact that some growing regions will rogue um, vines to try to you know, salvage blocks. And I'll just comment that, um, that that is true. There are regions where they've done some economic analyses where they've looked at cost of land, cost of production, what the end use is for that fruit and any price penalties associated with um, the poor quality associated with some of these viruses. And, and then they've reached a threshold and that number thrown out is often 25%. If tw less of 25% of the block is infected rogue vine. So over 25% take the block out. Um, so, in, in terms of Nova Scotia, I mean, you're welcome to do what you want on your farm, but uh, we haven't really done those analyses yet, right? We're not really entirely sure about what the economic implications are um, for our growing region with these viruses. Um, and then the other issue with roguing is that you have to have a pretty clear symptomology. So some of this roguing is based on red buried vinifera, and depending on the virus, it, they can have pretty predictable or reliable symptoms and um, and vineyard workers have been trained to recognize these. So what they'll do around raison is go through, look for these symptoms, flag vines, and then during the dormant period, they'll remove them and they'll remove the remnant roots as well. Um, with leaf rollers, some concern about mealybugs being able to spread um, virus from remnant roots to newly planted virus free material. So, um, so yes, it is done in some regions, but the concern here is that um, really you'd have to index kind of your entire block molecularly to be able to be sure which vine is infected and which is not because um, we just don't have the information yet across multiple cultivars, what the symptoms look like and whether you can reliably um, ro just rogue based on visual symptoms. So. Again, that's one of the goals that we're working towards, uh, the Royal We, uh, you know, the research is working towards trying to identify the different symptoms and different varieties and whether we could do something reliably like Rogue, but the, that a large focus of that has been on uh, red berry vinifera to date. Thank you very much, Kendra, for, for the explanation and all the details. So Steve, would you like to, to close this session? Uh, I'd just like to thank everyone uh, for both presenting and tuning into this. Uh, I think it's been a great session, really interesting uh, work, Kendra. And uh, I know we've used to live a couple times on stuff and it's great. It's such a huge resource to be able to take the question out of things. You know, you, you see a trunk disease or a vine or a virus and you're skeptical, but to get the proof of what's going on there is a huge advantage. So, um, no, that's a really great presentation. We really thank you for all the work you do. So other than that, it's been a great, great session and uh, another interesting few weeks in the vineyard. I think uh, we're kind of planning uh, another one of these for some time in July. So uh, until then, everyone have a great growing season and stay safe and we'll see you again.